I mean, we saw in July, the state failed, absolutely clearly, you know, for, for days on end, people were looting and doing what they wanted. And there was no state, there was no army, there was no police. And uh, you, you can't not believe in state failure when you've been through that. Now, I think that's the only way that you would get secession of the Cape or anything like that. That clearly, you know, if the state was simply in, in such a parlous situation that it was unable to do anything to stop that, well, then obviously people who wanted to walk away would do so and would, in a sense, be forced to do so because nobody else would be willing to take on the responsibilities of governance. Hello, my name is Donald, and welcome to the number one media company, Worldview. At Worldview, we explore everyone's perspectives on all things that can broaden our worldview. Today, we're talking of R.B. Johnson. Bill is a British journalist, political scientist, and historian who resides in South Africa. He was educated at Natal University, Oxford University, and he is a Rhodes Scholar. Between 1995 and 2001, he was the director of the Helen Suzman Foundation, and he is currently a fellow of Magdalene College, Oxford, where he has taught for 26 years. Bill is the author of many books, such as How Long Will South Africa Survive, Fighting for the Dream, and For a Native, an account of his life in Africa. Bill, welcome to the show. Nice to be here. So, Bill, we've just had a very historic local election result with the ANC for the first time falling below 50%. What is your opinion of this result? Was it a political earthquake? I don't think so, no. Um, it was part of a process of decline uh, of the ANC vote. It just happened to go below the 50 mark this time, but it was a matter of time before that happened. Um, the question, I mean, the, the decline seems to have accelerated. So the big question is, you know, it, will this continue? And uh, if it does at the same speed, then clearly the, the whole coherence and unity of that party is, is, is at stake. Uh, it was a very bad result. Uh, I think the key point really was that when I was doing opinion surveys for the last general election in 2019, we did try and test uh, what sort of effect Ramaphosa had on the ANC vote. And we found that there were 11% of voters who were basically fed up with the ANC and didn't trust it, but who said they did have confidence in Ramaphosa and would therefore uh, support the ANC. In other words, he, he was making that difference. It would have gone below 50 in that election, but for his personal uh, effect. Now, it su suggests that although he's still quite popular, that his ability to prop the party up has uh, considerably diminished and that uh, that sort of special factor has seems to have gone or be down to a very small level. Why do you think that's the case that he's, he's managed to distance himself from his party, that he is more popular than his party. How does he achieve that? Well, I think that it was true, probably, of all the presidents. Uh, we don't have comparable data for all of them. I'm sure it was true for Mandela uh, that he was more popular than the party, and I suspect it was for Mbeki. So I don't know about Zuma, though. But um, certainly it's what I would expect because the president is, you know, the key personalities, he's in the forefront of one's imagination and all reporting and so forth. So he's a larger than life figure for most people. And they have opinions about him much more than they do about the party usually. So that, uh, you know, and this is well known in other presidential systems too. Uh, you know, I mean, de Gaulle was always far more popular than the Gaullists and, and so forth. Uh, and very often it's been, true in America. So that's not unusual in itself. But what one tends to find in such systems is that as it, a process of what sociologists call routinization takes place, so that uh, over time, 
you know, that margin, which is, is the presidential margin, does tend to diminish because, after all, he's not a magic man and he is identified with the successes and failures of the government at the end of the day. So the longer it goes on, the more he tends to, the two, the two figures will come together. And that's certainly what's been happening here. Mm, well, that's fascinating. And I believe another interesting thing to watch will be the next ANC conference in 2022. Who do you believe will be elected as the deputy president there and eventually succeed um, Ramaphosa? <coughs> what do you think will happen there? <coughs> well, it's quite difficult to say because the current occupant, David Mabuza, doesn't really seem to be much of a, a prospect. He's got a reputation as a crook. Uh, there are even books showing that he was and possibly still is a crook. And his health hasn't been very good. And there seems to be discontent with him as a deputy president, even inside the ANC. So I think there's a general supposition that they'll have to come up with somebody different. Now, I think that would have been Zwellium Keys because for fairly obvious reasons, it would be useful to have a Zulu, particularly if the central <clears throat> presidential office is having continuous trouble with KwaZulu Natal, which it looks like it will while Zuma is still around. So uh, it would be good to have a heavyweight Zulu who like Zueli had been uh, premier of the province and had a following of his own. But he has messed that up because of the digital vibes affair which in that sense, uh, I think, you know, he was well positioned otherwise. He'd been quite good as far as the electorate was concerned over the COVID. And uh, they liked the idea that he was a qualified doctor and he had a certain gravitas. But by uh, the, the digital vibes affair, it, it's very strange because quite clearly his family benefited from that, uh, particularly his son. And uh, in a sense, he seems to have chosen to steal a bit now rather than wait until becoming president when he could have stolen a lot more. Uh, so um, he sort of seems to have really knocked himself out of the reckoning. So I suppose that the most likely person after that is Paul Machatile, uh, because he's known to be ambitious. He's, uh, he would be young enough uh, to do so. He's already treasurer general, one of the top six. Uh, but there's a problem, which is, if you look at it, all the presidents to date have had some sort of struggle record. Mandela, obviously, Mbeki in the exiled ANC, Zuma in um, MK and exile, and Ramaphosa even as a trade unionist and UDF leader. And we would now go, in other words, into completely new territory, somebody who has got no struggle record to speak of at all, and uh, who therefore doesn't have any national profile. Uh, I mean, the others, if you think of it, all the presidents we've had to date were famous men before 1994. We've been using up that, and the ANC has failed to renew itself. It's been relying on the people who were famous before 94, and it's now running out of those. And I, I'm not sure how well Machatile could do in this role because he's really only known in Kauteng. Uh, he's a Shangan, which is not a very large group uh, and has some of the same problems as, as uh, being a vendor, which Ramaphosa has. I mean, it's quite obvious that, you know, if you know KwaZulu Natal, you know that Zulus will never take very kindly to being ruled by a vendor. It's just a big problem. And uh, oh, why is that? Well, it goes all the way back to, I mean, if you ask Sulu people about that, they'll they'll go into things about what happened in the time of Shaka and say the vendor would run away if the Zulu MPs came and this sort of thing. They, literally, they would make remarks like that. Uh, and um, so, I mean, I think that is a problem and I suspect that it's affected Ramaphosa's self-confidence and it's why he dithers and is indecisive and so forth. I think he knows that he doesn't have the net. I mean, look, the dominant group in this country are the Nguni people, Zulu Kosa. And uh, in a sense, it, it's easier if the president comes from that group. 
but uh, we, we've now stepped outside that group with uh, Ramaphosa, and if it were Machetide, we'd do it again. That's interesting. What do you think of the chances of a person like Tande Modise, the former Speaker of the House, the current Minister of Defence, a woman, she has a struggle record. Don't you think perhaps Ramaphosa elevated her to the position of Minister of Defence um, to get her into the position of Deputy President? Well, it's possible, but um, I hadn't thought of it truthfully. Look, the ANC has, has been very much a male preserve, always. Uh, there's never been a woman leader picked. Uh, so all I can say is it would be very, very new territory if they already did go that way. I, I would be surprised. Yeah, it's a, it'd be an interesting experiment because many of their voters are conservative. But um, if we can pivot to a very interesting article <coughs> you wrote about um, the Freedom Front Plus, um, you said that a lot of English white South Africans love the idea or are very interested in the ideas of the Freedom Front Plus, which are federalism, Cape independence, conservatism but they are not comfortable voting for the party because it has that sort of national party um, brand, affiliate brand. Um, what do you think the Freedom Front Plus can do to get over that? Or, or can you explain what you wrote in that article? Well, I take it when you say English white, you mean English speaking, not uh, actually yes. English. Yeah. Yes, sorry. Uh, equally, there's no such thing as a national party affiliate because the national party doesn't exist, but um, it hasn't done for 20 odd years. But uh, I take it, I, I understand what you're, what you're saying. Um, well, look, I think that what I was saying about that is that a lot of English speaking whites in South Africa, uh, and I mean, I, I, I think that they're particularly prominent in the sort of Cape independence movement. They're rather apolitical people or non-political people. And uh, they probably would have been United Party in the old days. Uh, and I think the problem is that the Freedom Front, rather like uh, Solidarity and Afri Forum, put themselves forward very much in an Afrikaans way. And quite clearly, uh, the feeling is there, one, that the, the, the Afrikaans nation is threatened, as it was after the Anglo-Boer War, and that they've really got to stand together to, to get through this trial, which they are now undergoing. And to that extent, it's, it's deliberate. I mean, there are a lot of English speakers who are sympathetic, uh, particularly to Solidarity Afri Forum and rather admire it. But um, Afri Forum and Solidarity always behave as if that's not much of much interest to them, you know, uh, and they're far more willing to take up the cause of African speaking colored people uh, than white English speakers. But obviously if they did decide and the Freedom Front decided that they wanted to go that route, then they would need some English speakers in their leadership. And uh, at the moment there aren't such people. Mind you, having said that, after I wrote that article, I was quite struck by the fact that a number of English speaking whites that I came across made the point that that wouldn't stop them supporting them, uh, that uh, they uh, ha had a good opinion of them and so forth. And one, one has to keep one's eye on that because we live in an age of racial polarization. Uh, it's a very unfortunate fact, but it's true that the more this government fails, the more you get white people reverting to sort of primary racist attitudes saying Africans are hopeless, always will be, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I see it all the time. And it's very unfortunate because those attitudes were very common in the apartheid era, but they then vanished in the new South Africa during the rainbow nation phase. And everyone was much relieved, I think. And it was genuinely progress that we got beyond those sort of attitudes. So it's rather disappointing to see them back again. But it's, I think, you know, the, the, the sheer failure of the ANC government and the failure of the economy and all the things that go with that are exerting great pressure on people. And this is how they respond. So it can be as simple as just getting more um, English speaking South Africans into your party. 
if that's what they want. Uh, as I say, I'm not sure that they want it, but uh, if they do, that's what they would need to do. They'd have to have some prominent English speakers in their leadership. Yeah. Another party that seems to uh, struggle with the image of being a, only a white party is the DA under the leadership now of John Stienhausen and Helen Ziller. Um, do you think there's anything that they can do against that image created by the media? Or is it just um, a foregone conclusion that they are now a party for minorities, whites in particular? No, there's no foregone conclusion. I mean, it, the story never ends, as it were. But um, look, in a society like this one, where racial polarization is a fact, and where indeed the dominant party has now only that to rely on. You know, it's got to use it because it can't say we're doing a grand job of governing the country, look how well the economy is doing, etc. All they've got left is appealing to racial solidarity. So they will. And after all, they come from the 80% group and that's their only winning ticket. So it may it, it's a difficult thing to put together a truly multiracial party in a racially polarized uh, electorate. But it's not impossible. And indeed, the DA was making good progress in that direction uh, until 10 or so years ago. And then I think they, they uh, lost the plot in several different ways, uh, which I can go into if you want. But uh, I, I think that the problems they've got now are the result of their own mistakes uh, and that they uh, didn't need to make those mistakes. They were just bad errors. Uh, how did they lose the plot? Was it the mistakes of Musi Maimane? No, before that, under Zilla. Uh, look, two things. First, they began to move to become what was generally called ANC light. Their policies moved in that direction. Now, I think that was a very bad decision by Zilla because, uh, look, <laughs> It's a bit like I, I was living in England at the time when the Scottish Nationalists first rose to prominence in the 1970s. And, you know, what you then found was that Labour and the Liberals particularly immediately changed policy so as to agree that there must be a Scottish Parliament. Now, this I think was very foolish of them because if that's what you want, if you want devolution to a more federal system, well, first of all, by, by coming out with that, you are legitimating what the Scottish Nationalists say. And secondly, if that's what you're keen on, why not vote for the SNP rather than Labour or Liberals? That's the real thing, the real McCoy, you know. So, I mean, at the end of that sort of bidding war over this, you end up with the Scottish Parliament, which has almost 100% SNP people in it, and Labour wiped out in Scotland. I mean... It, it's no good being a me too party because if you if that's what you're being you know if all the girls want to look like marilyn monroe then the boys will go for marilyn monroe because that's the real thing you know and so it's a bad idea and they should have kept their, their specifically liberal focus that they've had and which been so successful under tony leon that was very big error one and you actually used to come across young DAMPs in that period who would say, I don't know what the principles of the party are anymore. I mean, what a situation to get into. But secondly, they went in for identity politics where um, they would get hold of particularly the African people, uh, though not only, uh, also of course, Patricia DeLille, and recruit them into the party and almost immediately give them absolutely top jobs. This happened, I mean, you know, Zilla brought in uh, Montpella Rampelli and tried to make her the party's presidential candidate. She wouldn't even join the party, for God's sake. And this was done with Lindiwe Mazibuko. It was later done with Maimane. It was done with Mashaba, who had no history in the DA at all. Now, in every case, what you're doing is you're taking people with no record uh, of or history in that party no traditional loyalty to it. And by jumping them to the top, uh, we've seen this, of course, or over and over again in South Africa, it's affirmative action stuff. You, what you basically say to them is you don't have to go through the normal uh, career building phase. 
we're going to jump you straight to the top of the queue and maybe you will be the leader of the party. And, you know, people that you do that to usually believe that, that this isn't affirmative action, it's due to their own extraordinary merit. And it tends to make them rather difficult and rather demanding and so forth. And then, of course, if they don't cut it, you've got a big problem because you build them right up. They will be extremely offended if you demote them at all. And then they peel off and start other competing parties uh, which take away your vote. And that, the, the DA has done all of those things. And it was a quite, first of all, it was ridiculous to think that you could simply get African votes by putting in a couple of Africans jumping them to the top like that. But above all, what they needed to do, of course, they needed to recruit people from all racial groups, but they needed then to make them do what everyone else had to do, which is to earn their spurs in the normal way. And first of all, become an MP or a councillor, whatever it is, and then slog through being on this committee and that committee. And then if they're good enough, make them an opposition spokesman and see how they do with that and then try them in a more ambitious portfolio. And this is what happens normally. So that somebody who gets to the front has had 10 or more years working at the cold face and is now a committed party person and so forth. And they're not gonna run away if they get disappointed. They, they know they're in for the long haul. That's what they should have done. But they were in a hurry because they wanted, they thought that, you know, we, if we've got somebody, a, a prominent African by the next election, we'll get African votes. Well, it's not that simple. Anyway, the result was disastrous. And it, it, what it meant was that they had been gaining at every election, election after election. They had wonderful feeling of momentum and optimism, which ran through all their supporters. And they spoilt it. And they lost that momentum. And I think their supporters are, are very resentful of this and in a bad temper with the party. You came across it a lot in the last elections, that they were not in a good mood at all. And that even party regulars would tell you that they were worried because would people bother to vote and they were, you know, they were, they were fed up. And this, I'm afraid, was all self-inflicted damage. It need not have happened. And it's a difficult thing to build a multiracial party, but they were doing it jolly well until they started on these things. And now, of course, they want to turn around and reverse themselves. Well, OK, fine, they've learned their lesson, but what an expensive education that was. And it'll be very, very difficult now. They've got to stop the rot and then turn it all around. And that's not easy. And, uh, you know, momentum is a precious thing and they threw it away. That's fascinating. So uh, can you say many of these former leaders or members of the Democratic Alliance, like Lindiwe Matsubuku, Musi Maimane, the reason why they are so bitter is because they were promised the world and they didn't get it. They, they, they were promised yes, the world. Yes. Look, I mean, you've got to remember back in, in the 1970s and 80s, uh, Colin Eglin was the party leader. And then up came Francel Slovak who was obviously very charismatic, very popular. And so they went to Eglin and said, listen, Colin, a lot of people would like from sale to be leader. Would you step down? Now, this wasn't very nice for him, but he said, oh, all right. And he did. And they made Slavat leader and Eglin carried on loyally in the sort of uh, leadership team under Slavat. And then when Slavat finally left, they turned around to Eglin and said, would you be leader again? And he said, oh, all right. Now, you see, that's what a party loyalist does. He doesn't, I mean, when they told Musi to stand down, he immediately leaves the party and, and supports its opponents. I mean, there's no loyalty there at all because there's no history uh, in the party, you know. And um, I, I think that this is just a huge mistake in the way that they did this accelerated promotion. And they even had this program for young up and comers in the party called the Future Leaders Program. Now, this is a dreadful idea to take a mainly brown and black group of people to tell them in advance, you are future leaders. Now, first of all, this sends a terrible message to people who are white or Indian or whatever, because there aren't many of them in that group. 
you know, you're telling them why bother with a parliamentary career. Uh, but secondly, it's absolutely dangerous and absurd to tell young people in advance that you are our future leaders, you are building up their expectations to a level that you will not really be able to fulfill. And you've got to let them, look, if it's always been true for white politicians who had better life chances and better educations and so forth, that they had to earn their spurs by slogging away for years on the back benches or whatever, before they got to, to leadership positions, why should you decide that for people who've had many less advantages that you can skip all that? It's completely ridiculous. And the truth is that it was done for short-term electoral reasons, and it shouldn't have been. It was a very big and very naive mistake. Mm, absolutely. I, I can one and say Helen Ziller is one of the main reasons why the DA is struggling at the moment, and it would be best if she retired from politics. Well, I know a lot of people do feel that, and I think that a lot that that opinion has probably hardened uh, over the period. Because, look, um, she has many merits, of course. Uh, she's energetic and she's intelligent and uh, so on. But I think she's been there more than long enough, and she's now over seventy. You know, it's. But above all, I think she makes it very difficult for John Steenhazen. I mean, I noticed when you introduced the subject, you said you talked about their two leaders, you know. Well, that wouldn't have happened when she was leader. It would have just been the one leader, wouldn't it? Or with Tony Leon or whatever. But uh, in effect, there's this dual leadership structure. And the polls show that Seton Hazen doesn't have the name recognition or the general respect which comes from being the sole leader. And I think it just makes it very difficult for him uh, and that, uh, you know, particularly since uh, Helen tends to, you know, put herself in the front row, as it were. Um, I mean, if there's a story in the Sunday Times saying that the DA are double-crossing Mashaba, it's not Steenhazen who answers that, it's Zilla. Now, when James Self was the chairman, he wouldn't have said a word, it would have been left to the leader to do that, you know. Uh, but Helen charges in and uh, tends to, to put herself forward as the, the main voice of the party. And that, I think, is very difficult for Stina. Mm. Uh, speaking of action essay, I mean, it, I think a lot of people were surprised with the result in Gauteng and in cities like Johannesburg and Pretoria. What do you think is the appeal and the future of a party like action essay with its leader, Herman Mashaba? Well, I think that... Um, that's quite a difficult question for several reasons. One is that we have seen, of course, both with COPE, uh, UDM and so forth, uh, parties which start, have one promising election and then fade. So we don't yet know whether that will happen to Action South Africa. Uh, but what the situation which we face in the elections which just finished is that the governing party had lost popularity. People were very fed up with it indeed. And yet, on the other hand, for various reasons, the main opposition wasn't also that popular. And there was therefore a bit of a gap. There needed to be something else. Now, in many cases, people voted for local parties or whatever, independents, whatever it was, you know, but they, they looked for a another. Uh, solution to that question. But in the shape of Mashaba, uh, in Kauteng at least, there was a ready-made answer alternative for you. He was prominent, he'd been mayor and so forth. But I think the problem with Action South Africa is that it's far too much about one person. Uh, it, it's about Mashaba and the myth of his wealth. And I say myth because it's always put out that he really made his money uh, by, you know, uh, simple entrepreneurialism, whereas actually his money did come from BE, uh, and um, which is a, a, a less dramatic way. And uh, secondly, you know, it's been clear in the negotiations that Mashaba 
that the whole point of the party and of his whole political action for him is to become mayor again. So the, the Action South Africa have been negotiating, even though their party got fewer votes than, say, the DA, they, they, they wanted their man to be mayor again. And it's as if the whole thing is a personal vehicle for him to become mayor. Now, uh, I don't think he will become mayor again uh, because the DA don't seem keen to advance him and why should they be? And uh, the ANC will certainly want their own guy. So, uh, you know, I think that project will not actually happen. And um, the other side of it, of course, is that Mashaba has the advantage of speaking out very plainly on the issue of foreign uh, immigration to South Africa and saying that he's against it and so on. Now, <coughs> that is a powerful issue. <coughs> There's no doubt at all that he speaks for a large number of people when he says that. And, you know, I was in England at the time when Enoch Powell had his great success over that issue. And what had happened was that the elite, the parliamentary elite, Labour and Conservative and Liberal, had all carefully looked the other way. They didn't want to take up the issue because it sounded racist and so on. But then finally, when Powell took it up, there was this huge sort of mushrooming of support for him because at last there was someone saying what was actually a very key issue in the pubs and clubs you know on the street and that in the same way as we all know that this is an issue which does agitate the street and no one speaks for it now except Mashaba and I think that that's a, a, a very powerful factor of course he gets called a racist and uh, all sorts of things for it, but um, uh, it, it's, it's a plus factor for his party, there's no doubt. But I think that it will be difficult because his party, its whole identity is to do with him. It's very much a provincial reputation and even a Joburg reputation. And uh, it's not clearly uh, making anything like the same inroads outside Gauteng, uh as in that area. Uh, and as I say, he's not going to be mayor again. So it will be difficult for them to maintain their momentum and, and their impact. Uh, so I, I think it'll be, you know, the next couple of years will be, will be interesting uh, to see whether that party can sustain itself. Definitely. Um, and yeah, I also believe uh, anti-illegal immigration stance is much more powerful than most political analysts believe. Why do you think that's not reflected in polling? Why don't mo more people say, say that illegal immigration is a issue to them? Well, I don't know. I haven't seen much polling data about this. Um... Look, whenever I've had that question in, there's been quite a considerable response. Uh, there's no doubt that it, it has, uh, it, it's, has, as they say, valence. Uh, it, it, it has weight and, and, and strength, that issue. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but um, I suppose, you know, the fact that everyone regards it as sort of politically incorrect uh, has, has made it harder. But, you can't get rid of it. And it, it would be true in any society where you've got very high unemployment and at the same time, millions of people from outside that country are in the country competing for jobs. I mean, that is bound to produce huge social and political friction. It would in the UK, it would in France, it would anywhere that I know. And uh, you can't possibly expect it not to. It's just bound to be so. Absolutely. Um, so, Bill, what do you think the future holds for South Africa? What do you think will happen in South Africa by 2030? Will we see a breakup of South Africa? Will we see something like um, Cape Independence? What will happen? Well, uh, we don't know, but uh, one can have various scenarios. And of course, the most obvious scenario is always that things will carry on as they are now. Uh, so one has to regard that as a possible scenario. And when one says that, what I mean is that a, a government which basically doesn't do very much, uh, which is rather becalmed, which presides over very high unemployment, 
a very poor law and order. But the problem is, of course, that things don't stand still. And even if the ANC would like them to, they still won't. And as we can see, politically, <laughs> uh, they're losing ground. And it does seem likely that they will continue to do so. And uh, the outlook economically is not good, so that one could see unemployment rising still further. And on the law and order front, I think that, um, you know, the, the Franz Cronier's scenario was one of what, which there sort of, that in the cities, increasingly they'll be run by gangs and that in the countryside by pretty authoritarian chiefs. And then outside that, you will get a bubble in which middle-class whites and uh, the middle classes of other groups try to continue to exist in a fairly comfortable way and that their world will be the world of their suburbs and their local shopping center and so forth. But that outside of that bubble, um, life will be very rough and tough indeed. And uh, one can see that, you know, things are moving in that direction. There's no doubt about it. And um, the way that the Ingonyama Trust has been behaving, you know, more or less extorting rents from, from ordinary Zulu people for land that they would normally have got free, granted by the chiefs. I mean, it's exactly what, what he was talking about, you know, that chiefs becoming more rapacious and so forth and using their leverage. Uh, so, I mean, that's obviously one scenario which we are drifting towards, but uh, where there are several other scenarios. One is obviously the one which I've written about, which is that as our debt, which is still increasing and uh, the amount of interest we pay is still increasing, uh, that if that goes beyond a certain point, then we will end up with the need for an IMF bailout. And now an IMF bailout would be a sort of gotta dabber room because the conditions would certainly include uh, liberalization of the labor laws, which would effectively abolish Kasatu and probably the SACP. Uh, the cutting of both the numbers and the wages of the public service, which would create huge trouble on that front and undoubtedly the privatization of many state-owned enterprises. Now, <coughs> as you can see, that would split the ANC into those who are, were willing to accept such a deal and those who weren't. And it would produce uh, absolutely enormous political fallout. But of course, if you get to a point where you need an IMF loan, you can't really argue, you, you have to follow the conditions. So. If that were to happen, then there's no doubt that there would be a huge, there would be a major political change in the whole situation. And a whole lot of things which at the moment are on the back boiler would uh, you know, come to the boil and um, get dealt with. Uh, it's possible, of course, though unlikely, that the ANC, in order to stop that from happening, would carry out its own internal reform program which would include the privatization of a number of the big SOEs. Now, you see, that's a very important thing because at the moment, it's quite clear that the SOEs are all pleading for money and they need more capital, whether you're talking about the ports or the railways or ESCOM or all of them, the land bank, et cetera, post office, you, you name it, they're all desperate for money and on the edge of going bust and so on. Now, the government doesn't have that money and is saying that it won't provide it. In which case, the only way you can get that money is to bring in the private sector. And in that sense, privatization is the absolutely obvious thing that now ought to be happening with state-owned enterprises. But as we know, the political veto against that from Kasatu, SACP, etc., is very, very strong. And uh, it would be huge political ructions if you go that route. Uh, mind you, it's happening with SAA, and uh, maybe it has to happen, but I just doubt that the ANC will have the unity or the strength 
to take on such a tough issue and carry it through and fought it through. But that is obviously a possible way out. And of course, finally, uh, you know, one could indeed see the breakdown of the order we, we live in and the breakdown of the state. The state is obviously very weak now. And I mean, we saw in July, the state failed. Absolutely, clearly, you know, for, for days on end, people were looting and doing what they wanted. And there was no state, there was no army, there was no police. And uh, you, you can't not believe in state failure when you've been through that. Now, I think that's the only way that you would get secession of the Cape or anything like that. That clearly, you know, if the state was simply in, in such a parlous situation that it was unable to do anything to stop that, well, then obviously people who wanted to walk away would do so and would, in a sense, be forced to do so because nobody else would be willing to take on the responsibilities of governments. And uh, that is, you know, it's, it's a dramatic scenario, but it cannot be ruled out altogether now because we have seen the state get steadily weaker and uh, fail in many respects. So those are the big four scenarios. Um, as for which of those is going to happen, it, it's difficult to say. I would say that the most likely is the first one where you try to soldier on, but the trouble is that, you know, first of all, the ANC is losing support. And secondly, in order to stand still, they now need to carry out some of these reforms, possibly including privatization. Uh, and I don't know whether they can face up to that. Uh, and lots of other things are going wrong at the same time. Uh, particularly now water, I mean, it's bad enough to have the electricity situation, but uh, if water becomes as big a problem as it might, then, you know, uh, that, that really is uh, a big thing. People go crazy when they're deprived of water uh, very quickly. I've seen it uh, in the top uh, and wow, you know, uh, there were areas which I knew uh, down the south of Natal where there was no water and they would simply stone all the cars that came through, you know, just show their anger with the situation and whole areas would get blocked off by the police because people are going crazy because they don't have water. And, uh, you know, they don't do that over electricity, uh, but water can produce very, very violent reaction. And I think also, to be quite frank, the failures over sewage uh, or, I mean, you know, sooner or later, if we keep on having sewage flowing in the streets, you're going to get some sort of epidemic uh, from that, you know, which will be a self-caused epidemic, not, not COVID, but, you know, one of our own. And so all of these things are sitting in the winds, uh, you know, and could happen. So that, and, and of course, we've also got the situation in the big cities, certainly in Joburg and certainly in Durban, where the city government has failed so badly that those cities are sort of falling to pieces. And, uh, you know, we, we don't, I mean, that, that also could reach dramatic proportions. Uh, you know, this is not like the rest of Africa. This is not a rural cash crop economy. This is not Ghana. This is a place where the bulk of the population lives in the big cities. And, uh, if, if you can't make those cities work tolerably, then there will be real trouble. And, um, you know, we, we do look as if we're heading that way. Yeah, um, it's interesting. Um, a lot of people talk about a shortage of food, but like you said, water is also a massive problem if you have a, a shortage of water. Um, but I believe another scenario you mentioned in your book is a bailout by the Chinese. Um, no, not really. I don't take that very seriously. Actually, I don't think the Chinese would have any wish to do that. And uh, they're not trying to compete with the IMF as a sort of coming to the rescue and dishing out hard conditions. It's not a fun game to be in. And uh, I don't see why they would want to do that. And uh, it's not something that I, I regard as a very serious possibility. But look, um, you, I don't know about food shortage. I mean, our agriculture is wonderfully productive and just had a fantastically good year and is exporting a lot. 
provided they don't do anything really crazy like Mugabe did in Zimbabwe, i.e. leave the productive farmers to farm, then we can produce enough food. We shouldn't be short of food. Of course, the problem is price, uh, because with so many people unemployed, can they afford the food that's in the shops? Is is there more of a question, really? But uh, we can't produce enough food. Yeah, uh, sorry, I, I was talking more about inflation. Uh, then it will be a shortage in terms of you can't afford the food. Um, but th- th- there seems to be a lot of pressure on the DA to all the referendum in the Western Cape on Cape independence. Do you think there's a possibility that that referendum will win in terms of the leave vote will win to secede from South Africa? Well, um, hang on, before you get to that, I think in order to hold such a referendum, First of all, I think the central government would have to agree to it, and I can't see them agreeing to it. Uh, Secondly, it would be a big problem for the DA because uh, the DA has kept quiet on that issue because it still has ambitions as a national party and the bulk of its votes are in Gauteng. That's where the biggest single block of DA votes is. So uh, they, they have no wish to take up the issue of Cape independence. Uh, Jordan Hill Lewis carefully in his campaign talked about doing more and of obviously having a greater degree of autonomy and more of a city state basically. Uh, but he didn't use that word and he was careful. He was appealing to the independence vote without using the word. And that was a perfectly sensible thing to do. Uh, but. I don't think the DA is going to be in a hurry to hold such a referendum. I think if you did manage to hold such a referendum, uh, it would have a reasonable chance of passing. I mean, the last poll we saw said 58% wanted a referendum. And usually people want a referendum when they want to vote for that thing. You know, that's anyway, that's been true in Scotland. But um, and I think that the, the, the pro-independence people have rather altered the way they campaign. And they now particularly say, look, South Africa is a mess. We don't want to go down with the ship. We want to get off that before something terrible happens. <coughs> That's quite a potent line. So that issue won't go away. <coughs> and of course, the contrast between the Cape and the rest of the country gets increasingly strong. And I mean, you know, we're now, if, if cities are allowed to have, generate their own power, obviously that's an expensive thing. Cape Town's got the money to do it. Uh, most of the metros don't. So you could easily imagine a situation where Cape Town alone has electricity and the rest of the country doesn't. Now, I mean, you know, once you get a contrast like that, good heavens, I mean, all the businesses will move to the Cape and so will the people and, you know, you, and I, I don't think the ANC can afford that contrast. You know, it's just too awful for them. Um, and uh, it reminds me of, you know, in Zimbabwe, they used to say during power cuts, Oh, thank God we've got candles. What did we do before we had candles? And people would say electricity. And, you know, if you, if you put it as starkly as that, um, say, you know, that voting A and C means candles and voting DA means having electricity. Uh, well, you can see what that would do. But I, I think that that issue will not go away. Uh, the contrast is too great. And the fear of a further slide is also very strong. So, um, you know, it's it's there. Do you also think we can have a similar situation like uh, with the SNP and the UK where more federalism to the Western Cape will only enable it to advocate for independence more because they become more powerful in federalism. They, They become more successful as they become more federal. Well, that isn't a given. I mean, for example, they're campaigning, saying they would like to have their own police force and uh, to take over responsibility for the railways, which 
coffee work at all. Now, you know, that's a big ask. If, if they were to take over the railways, can they make them work? You know, it's a big if. Uh, so, I mean, and, and, you know, again, this has hurt the SNP in Scotland because if you look at them as simply how good are they at running Scotland, the answer is not very good, actually. Uh, it's all very well talking a lot about symbolic issues like independence and waving the flag and singing the song and all the rest of it. But, you know, how good are you at running things uh, is, is a different question. And um, I think that, so it would be a big test for them. But certainly uh, if they did manage to do those things successfully, it would certainly increase the appetite for more of the same help. Mm. So, Bill, I mentioned in the intro you were a former director of the Helen Suzman Foundation. I saw a very interesting video of Floyd Javambo saying in a panel discussion in Parliament that Helen, Suz Helen Suzman was part of the apartheid machinery. So he didn't do much to stop apartheid. She was part of it. Um, is, is he right? I, I don't believe he is, but obviously you will know the best answer to that. Who was Helen Suzman and did she do enough to stop apartheid? Frankly, that opinion is just, I don't think Floyd Jerome knows any history at all, really. Uh, and that if you did, you know that nobody did more. Uh, she was endlessly active and energetic and uh, even the ANC relied upon her absolutely because, you know, if, if you, I mean, I was in England for some of that time and the ANC, when they were putting out propaganda for their party, if you looked at it, it was tremendously reliant on the data which Helen Susman got with her parliamentary question. She got, because the Nats were pretty good at providing information. If you put down a question, they did answer it, which is not true of the current government. But um, Helen was a thorn in their flesh and she, you know, and she went to the prisons and got their conditions improved and Mandela and the prisoners, they thought the world of her uh, for that. Nobody else did that. And, uh, you know, uh, it is just simply ridiculous to say she was part of the party machinery. It's just absolute nonsense. And uh, I suppose the reason why Floyd Chirambu says something like that is that in the mental and intellectual world of the EFF, it is annoying to have white South Africans who are rather heroic figures for what they did. And they would therefore like to uh, pour shit on them or whatever, you know. Uh, and I can see it's a rather childish thing to do, but um, it, it's completely ridiculous, of course. And, uh, you know, she was tireless, she was brave, uh, she, she, and I knew her well, and, uh, you know, it was a completely ridiculous thing to say. She also brought the um, international attention to the issue of apartheid to all the countries in the world. I think she did to a considerable degree, and everyone was very taken with the drama of this single woman taking on the entire apartheid government. And, you know, she had a hard time. A lot of the National Party MPs were very anti-Semitic and very rude and brutal towards her and so forth. And... Um, Mind you, she always said that she owed a great deal to this Van Klopper, who was the speaker, because he treated her very fairly. And when she stood up wanting to make a speech, he would always recognize her. And he took the view that she may only be one person, but she represents a whole school of thought. So it's very important to hear what she's got to say. And she said, you know, you depend entirely on that. If you refused to recognize me, I wouldn't have had half the chances I got. So, I mean, the truth is that the parliamentary system worked rather well in, in that sense, you know. But um, certainly she got a lot of international attention as well and uh, honorary degrees around the world and all that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, quite rightly so, you know. And no one else was able to do those things. You know, it was very important to have somebody in parliament getting that information pushing the nuts, going and visiting the prisons, doing, getting the publicity and so on. And no one else could do that. She did it. 
Absolutely. And yeah, Bill, pivoting to the last question, I want to ask you, this has been a fascinating conversation. Last question I want to ask you is that you've written an article critical of South Africa's immigration stance um, in, in terms of allowing a lot of young people, I believe, into the country. It's, it's not um, positive to have a lot of young people in the country looking towards the future. Can you explain what you wrote in that article? No, I wasn't really concentrating so much on their youth, but look, it does seem to me that every country in the world has the right to control its own immigration policy. It's part of national sovereignty that you should be able to do so. And uh, we don't really seem to do that. Uh, our borders are open. We don't really control them. And we do have very large numbers of illegal immigrants. And as you know, this is a major social problem and political problem and so on, which we don't actually need to have. But of course, a lot of it derived from Tabo and Bakey's support of Mugabe. If the ANC had taken a decent line on that issue back in 2000 and basically forced through democracy in Zimbabwe, just like they had here, then that problem would have been dealt with and we wouldn't have had all these millions of Zimbabweans pouring down here. That was an unnecessary self-inflicted wound, but there we go. Um, look, I think the point I was making uh, in a more general sense was this, was that if you look around Africa, that uh, the birth rates, which basically as a result of colonial medicine uh, and therefore, you know, much, lower rates of infant mortality and people living much longer lives. But we have had very rapid increases in population. And we know that by the year 2050, there are going to be at least another billion Africans. Now, many African states are not coping as it is. Many of them are at war, civil war or whatever. Uh, it seems to me absolutely obvious that they are not going to be able to cope with that extra population. They will not be able to provide it with housing, jobs, education, et cetera, et cetera. And it will overwhelm them. <coughs> and that, look, having lots of vigorous young people in your population is jolly nice if you've got the jobs to give them. But if you haven't, then you've got a big problem. And most wars and revolutions depend on there being lots of unemployed young men. It tends to be a very explosive factor if you are not able to provide them with the basics. And a lot of those states are not going to be able to. And I do think that that is a big issue for us because if we have continue to have open borders, then we will get more and more people coming from this overwhelming population explosion which is going on in the rest of Africa and uh, our own population will not be tolerant of that. We know that, we've seen it already. So I, I just think that we need to think of these things and we need to decide you know what sort of population size we want and we need to control our borders. Um, and I don't think that that is in any way a uh, illegitimate objective. I think any national state in the world uh, can have that sort of objective and you can't help but complain, you know, it's just part of national sovereignty. What do you think would be a more sensible um, immigration approach, allowing skilled labor from first world countries easier access to your country? Well, it doesn't matter whether it comes from uh, developed countries or not, but we do need, we're very short of skills. So certainly we need skilled labor. The last thing we need is more unskilled labor. We've got plenty of that, thank you, far too much. Uh, so it is ridiculous to be allowing more unskilled labor to pour into the country. Uh, and, you know, you see it. Uh, if you take Australia or many countries in the world now, they have these quota systems where they say, you know, we're short of computer programmers and doctors and nurses and so on, but we don't need any more uh, stevedores or whatever it is, you know, uh, and 
that's accepted as a normal way of running an immigration policy. Well, obviously, we ought to have our own equivalent of that. And uh, we ought to be very pleased if we can get skilled people from anywhere, wherever they, they may come from, you know. Uh, if they come from Ghana or Nigeria, that's as good as coming from Britain or America. It doesn't matter. But um, So I, I think we certainly ought to limit immigration in terms of skills. That, that's undoubtedly so. Mm. Well, Bill, thank you so much for your time. Um, there's been absolutely um, wise perspectives that you've given our audience. I want to give you one last opportunity to add, plug, or say anything that you want to. No, no, really, I'm, I'm happy. It's up to you to put the questions on. I'm not going to ask myself questions. Okay, well, great. Thank you, Bill. So, thank you for your time. And to our viewers, okay. if, if you've made it this far, please consider liking this video, sharing this widely as possible, and subscribing to our channel. My okay. name is Donald, and you've been watching Worldview. <laughs>